One of the state's most brutal mass murders took place on Thanksgiving 20 years ago in Muskegon. Why did the killer do it? The community is still left searching for answers. Welcome to Michigan Crime Stories. Michigan Crime Stories is a podcast that explores murder, mysteries, and mayhem in the Mitten State. Criminal behavior has always enthralled us. It's when societies determine what is and isn't allowed. We assume heinous crimes are committed by monsters, individuals we dehumanize in an effort to make sense of their deeds. Their victims sometimes seem distant, just faded names in a passing headline. But the terrifying truth is that crimes are committed by ordinary people just like you and me. And many of those crimes happen right in our own backyard. My name is Darcy Moran. And this is John Counts. We're reporters for MLive.com and your hosts for Michigan Crime Stories. This episode is titled Muskegon Massacre. The story is told by longtime Muskegon Chronicle reporter Lynn Moore. Like any year, late November of 1998 was a time for family gatherings and giving thanks for starting off another holiday season. It was no different for the Provaki family which was gathering on Sunday, November 29th, for a late Thanksgiving. But the events of that day were nothing anyone would be thankful for. Before the family could sit down at the dining table, five of them would be shot dead, and a manhunt would be underway for the sixth and youngest family member who was the prime suspect in the gruesome murders. The Provaki family killings would go down as the worst mass murder in recent history for the Lake Michigan community of Muskegon, located on Michigan's western shore. Long after teenager Seth Provaki was captured and admitted to the killings, loved ones and authorities alike continued searching for some sort of explanation for the massacre. And in what the prosecutor remarked was an ironic twist in the case, Seth Provaki himself later would die in the same manner in which he did in his own victims. Bob Carter, who was sheriff of Muskegon County at the time, said the murders were, quote, a devastating blow to the rural area that is centered around the Reeths Puffer School District. It just rocked everybody's socks. Uh, you know, uh, in the school community and in the, you know, the close-knitness of uh, the Reese Buffer parents and all that kind of stuff, something like this came to their community and it just uh, tore everything apart. I mean, everybody was scared and um, I'm sure there were homes around the county that were uh, never locked before that and then for, I don't know, maybe even until today, they, maybe now they, they still lock their doors, but people were scared. It's believed the killings began around 12.45 p.m., but they weren't discovered for nearly 12 hours. It was around midnight when the parents of April Boss went looking for the 19-year-old. She had been invited to a Thanksgiving dinner with her boyfriend, Jedediah Provaki's family, at 1.30 that afternoon. But April never showed up to her third shift job, and so her mother and stepfather, Julie and Tom Cooper, went to the Provaki house looking for her. When they arrived, they saw a shadowy figure run from the garage area into the home and then spotted a man's body on the driveway lying between two cars. As they moved toward the house, the couple saw blood in the garage and a young man bolt outside and into the darkness. Alarmed, the Coopers used the house phone to call 911. Arriving police found more bodies inside the home. Two victims, April Boss and 78-year-old John Provaki, were found in a small back room off a garage. 19-year-old Jedediah Provaki was in the basement, and Jedediah's mother, 49-year-old Linda Provaki, 
was found in an upstairs bathroom. It didn't take long for investigators to figure out that the body in the driveway was that of 50-year-old Stephen Provaki. All five had been shot in the head. As other officers arrived, an 18-year-old man emerged from nearby woods and approached them. He had a story to tell. His name was Stephen Wallace, and he told police his good friend, Seth Provaki, had called him that afternoon to tell him he had killed his mother, father, grandfather, brother, and brother's girlfriend. Wallace said he went to the Provaki house and agreed to dispose of the murder weapon, Stephen Provaki's twenty two caliber handgun, which he tossed in a pond at a park several miles away. Wallace told police he returned to the house later that night and was helping Provaki cover up the murder scene when April Boss's parents arrived. His shocking revelation triggered a massive manhunt for Seth Provaki as the tight-knit Reese Puffer school community reeled at the horrific news. The high school, where Stephen Provaki had been a teacher and where Seth Provaki was a student, went on lockdown with fear that Seth might show up. Photos of Seth Provaki were distributed among students who might not have known the high school senior. I mean, they were they were really concerned about the kids, and were they safe? And was the community safe? The day was rainy, and the mood at the school was somber as news spread of the deaths of Jedediah and April, both of whom had graduated the previous year. 18-year-old student Genevieve Simonelli was so disturbed by the grief that she left school and was driving around when she saw a hitchhiker, a solitary, soaked figure, and stopped to give him a ride. She was shocked and terrified to discover the hitchhiker was Seth Provaki. Simonelli played it cool and took Provaki to the home of one of his friends where he asked to be dropped off. Then she called police. Finding no one home, Provaki, who had spent the previous night in nearby woods, hid out in a pole barn behind his friend's home. That's where police found him and arrested him around 1 p.m. During an interview with Muskegon County Sheriff Detective Captain Dennis Edwards, Provaki first claimed his brother, Jedediah, had committed the murders. But soon he gave a full confession. Edwards later would describe Provaki's demeanor as, quote, flat, like nobody's home. Provaki recounted a disagreement he'd had that morning with his father, who he said he argued with frequently. His father had said the 18-year-old needed to move out. As Seth put it, his father told him that his parents didn't love him anymore. It had come after months of arguments during which Provaki said his mother and brother would take his father's side. Seth Provaki said that out of anger and rage, he retrieved his father's gun, went to the living room, and shot Jedediah in the back of the head as the teen was sitting on a couch. He dragged his brother's body to the basement and waited for his father to come home. When Stephen Provaki arrived with his father, John, whom Seth was not expecting, he ambushed them in the garage and shot them both in the head. It took two shots to kill his grandfather. Next, the 18-year-old went upstairs where his mother had just gotten out of the shower. Linda Provaki also was shot in the head. The last to die was April Boss, who had seen the dead bodies of Provaki's father and grandfather when she arrived for what she thought would be a Thanksgiving dinner. Seth Provaki said he shot Boss in the head as she entered the kitchen. He claimed he didn't know she was coming to dinner either. When Provaki's friend Stephen Wallace arrived, they devised a plan to try to remove the bodies and bury them. After dragging the body of Provaki's father out to the driveway, 
They determined it was too heavy to lift into the trunk of a car they had lined with garbage bags. So they came up with another plan, to make the killings appear part of a robbery. They were in the process of removing valuables from the home, including a TV, VCR, and stereo, when Boss's parents showed up. Wallace ended up being tried for being an accessory after the fact. He was acquitted after successfully convincing jurors that he had helped Pravaki out of fear for his own life. Uh, I don't think that set very well with, with the community overall, even though, you know, the law, you have to follow the law, and the law said that he, was, he wasn't guilty, so. Seth Pravaki ended up pleading guilty to five counts of first-degree murder. Before sentencing Pravaki to life in prison without parole, Judge James Graves, Jr., told the teenager, quote, You turned what should have been a pleasant Thanksgiving weekend into your own killing field. The judge also denied Pravaki's bizarre request for time to see the world before he had to report to prison. Pravaki served 11 and a half years behind bars. On July 25th, 2010, he and two other convicted murderers overpowered a semi-truck driver making a delivery to the Kinross Correctional Facility in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, where they were incarcerated. The trio hijacked his truck and drove it through double fencing surrounding the medium-security prison and, once outside, fled on foot. The other two inmates ended up surrendering. Pravaki, who was 30 years old, was running across the street from the prison when a corrections officer shot him dead. Pravaki had been shot in the head, a fact that wasn't lost on Tony Tagg, the prosecutor, who had handled the murder case a dozen years earlier. Tagg called Pravaki's manner of death, quote, ironic. Carter said when he learned of Seth Pravaki's death, he felt a measure of closure to the entire tragedy. I felt that, well, at least now, uh, that part of, the, of it is being laid to rest. So, Nearly 20 years after he killed his family, Seth Pravaki remains an enigma. Many have searched for reasons why a seemingly normal teenager would massacre his entire family. He had been described by classmates as quiet and soft-spoken, yet from jail he had written members of a rock band he was in, including Wallace, that his newfound notoriety could be the break the band needed, quote, to make it big. After the murders, a family friend told investigators that Stephen Provaki had considered his son a psychopath without a conscience. Another friend said Stephen and Linda Provaki were concerned their son was heading for big trouble. After a couple juvenile theft charges and accusations of vandalism, they had taken their son for counseling, and he was prescribed an antidepressant. It probably had to do with substance abuse as well as maybe some mental illness. One of Linda Provaki's friends faithfully visited Seth while he was in prison. At the time of his death, Patty Moran described Seth Pravaki as, quote, kind, humble, intelligent, artistic, and spiritual. In 2007, Pravaki had claimed he had found Christianity. Wallace said that while they were growing up, Pravaki was a seemingly normal kid. Following Seth Pravaki's death, Wallace said he regretted that he had never asked Seth why. He killed his family. Okay, well, I am sitting here with John Counts and Lynn Moore, who is on the phone with us, who reported this story today. Um, Lynn, thank you so much for telling it. It is kind of a crazy one. So uh, this took place, you said, in a rural part near Muskegon. Can you just kind of set the scene for us? What kind of neighborhood was this in? What kind of family was this? Um, well, this was in a, a, an area um, that is 
I don't know, probably middle class to upper middle class. Um, if anybody is very familiar with the Muskegon area, there is a rather large um, amusement park called Michigan's Adventure, and their home uh, was near this park. It was in a, a wooded area, but homes around, um, you know, in, in, in close proximity. Um, the Provaki home actually does not exist anymore. It was torn down uh, as part of an expansion of the amusement park. So it, it, it's no longer there. So the amusement park is now over top of that land now? Yeah, I believe it may even be part of a campground that the amusement park later added. So so did you cover this as a reporter? Were you already at the paper at that time? or? I was. I, I was part of a team when it uh, occurred, um, as you can imagine, through just about every resource we had uh, added at the time. So, yes, I was uh, part of the, uh, the the reporting team at that time. In fact, I did interview the um, young lady who ended up picking up Seth Provaki as he was hitchhiking, um, and she ultimately was the one who uh, alerted police to his location. And she was certainly shaken up by the whole incident. Um, I can imagine back then high school lockdowns were, were really unheard of and to have her high school locked down and such grief. And then to be having a, an, a presumed killer right in your front seat, I, I, I can't imagine the terror she must have been experiencing at that time. And what was that like for the newsroom uh, handling that? Obviously, everyone here in this conversation has covered crimes before, but this is an extreme incident, obviously, and uh, it sounds like it really shook the entire community. Um, What was that feeling in the newsroom? Well, you know, certainly it's disbelief uh, that that could happen in our town. I mean, we're not a real big town. We don't have a lot of terrible things happen. Um, And the Provaki family... um, actually was fairly well known to to people um, in the Reese Pupper school area. My boss at the time, our metropolitan editor, his wife actually was a teacher in that school district, as was John Provaki, um, the victim, the, the father of Seth Provaki. He was a teacher at, with the Reese Pupper Intermediate School at that time. So uh, my boss, uh, his wife knew the victim, um, uh, the mother, Linda Provaki, she was very involved with Master Gardeners, so another reporter of ours um, knew her, and it, so it really did hit close to home. Um, and of course, just the tragedy of it being young people involved uh, was just, you know, really shocking for a, for a lot of us. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned to Michigan Crime Stories for more episodes of Mystery, Murder, and Mayhem in the Midden State.